Hi, and welcome to the Lone Star Play podcast, where we sit, eat, chat, and repeat. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong, and we are coming to you from Austin, Texas. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for local restaurants, stores, butchers, farmers markets, and more who are using organic, fresh, artisanal, and local sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. All right. Very excited about today's episode. Um, I've got my friend Max Kunick coming on. Uh, He's been on the podcast before. Um, Max is, you know, great businessman. Uh, He's got a couple businesses here in town. Um, He owns the Taster's Table Club, which is a, I'm going to let him explain it, but it's basically like a supper club. Um, And it's actually in a few states. Um, And he also owns a commercial kitchen here in town called RPM Kitchens. Um, So he's just going to talk to us today uh, with me about basically the best and creative ways that, you know, restaurants and food businesses can create revenue streams right now, different revenue streams. How can they pivot? What can they do to start, you know, making some extra money and and get through this time? Um, Okay, so let's get to it, guys. It's going to be a good episode. Sit back, relax, enjoy. Okay, so yeah, man, I just want to talk about basically all the, you know, cool, creative or interesting ways anyway, really, that uh, any food business, right, can create different revenue streams right now. In what ways can they pivot? Can they adapt? Can they change? You know, and what what cool things have you seen? You know, what what do you think they that people aren't doing that they could be doing? Uh, that sort of thing. We'll just, you know, see where it goes here. So you, you did something really, first of all, hang on. I sort of brought up Taster's Table Club, but I want you to explain it um, a little bit better. I just said Supper Club, but, you know, kind of give us <laughs> the one-two punch on that. Yeah, so we're not your traditional uh, dinner club, Taster's Table Club typically goes out to restaurants and we'll let the restaurants kind of showcase what they do every day. And so for our members, you pay a hundred dollars a year. And then on the third Tuesday of every month, you get to experience these different restaurants and six courses and a drink. You sit with eight to 12 people. So it's like a really cool social thing. But our big thing is like, we want you to try out what the restaurant does every day, which is really where we differentiate from a lot of these other supper clubs or dinner events or what, what might have you just because our whole goal is to get you back into the restaurant. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, I actually didn't even know that as much as I've dealt with Taster's Table Club this whole time. I've done dinners for Taster's Table Club. So the idea is you don't want people serving some different sort of cuisine. You want them to get exactly what they would get if they were to go on a regular day. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's Obviously, okay. we were doing dinners with you, you were trying to showcase everything else you can do. So maybe people would hire you for some private catering events or different things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for the most part, we try and keep restaurants to do what's on their daily menu. And maybe they'll throw in one item that they're contemplating putting on. And we, we have feedback cards for them just just to give them peace of mind and to know that like we're giving them real feedback and they can take it for what it is. Uh, we're, we're not throwing it on the internet, but most of the times it's super positive. Sometimes people want to see a little tweak in a certain dish. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, no, that's, I mean, it's great, man. That the, the, the taster's table club is awesome. Um, you know, when I hosted as cooking, it's great to have people come in that are excited about what you're getting ready to put in front of them. Like nothing better for the person who's cooking than that, right? Um, not to say that diners aren't like that, but sometimes you just want food and you get it, you eat, you're talking, you don't care about really what it is. But this is people that are coming in excited, they want to learn, they're foodie-ish, if you will, they're curious, um, you have their attention, and yeah, I think that's really cool. And then as a, as a, I've sat down and ate at them too, so you get that experience of hanging out with everybody and sharing experiences and and it is really cool you meet new people try new food and find a new place that you like uh to eat so yeah it is a cool uh, cool thing so look so taster's table club um did something pretty cool last night um and just tell us a little bit about that and is is it something you're going to continue to do 
Yeah. So because of everything that's happening, we're not comfortable with having groups going to or trying to force our members into going to restaurants uh, quite yet. And so we still want to have events and we still want to support local uh, chefs and local businesses. Um, so last night we worked with uh, local chef Peter Moffey. He's uh, over at the Courtyard Marriott in Pflugerville. Um and he had been doing a couple of these class, these virtual cooking classes, which is what we did with him last night. And so he did a private dinner with our group. We had about 12 people on the call, some couples, some people that were doing it by themselves. And it was like, a, you know, we had shrimp risotto. We had uh, Brussels sprouts with a pretty Thai sweet chili sauce. We had... Um, what was it a new york strip and and then we like an apple betty and like an hour and a half cooking class uh, it was a blast uh we also everyone got a bottle of wine and some kitchen beers and so chef peter was kind of on on the call leading it telling everyone being like oh let me see what this looks like because he's in a commercial kitchen so like none of us have a convection oven in our <laughs> it looks a little faster right so he's like well this is what mine takes this is what you should take but like take it out of the oven show me like give me the thumbs up all right let, let's keep it rolling because when you're doing that many things at once as a trained chef that you, you're on autopilot it's whatever but uh when you're a, barely a home chef it's a lot <laughs> Uh, so if I didn't have a sushi behind me, I had my roommate, Brian, also helping me out. Uh, if I didn't have that, uh, it might have looked like there was like a flower fight in my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, I love that. So the ingredient, so what, so what about the ingredients? So is that how it works? Like you pick up the whatever? Yeah, so what we did. What we did is we went and picked up everything from uh, Chef Peter and we delivered it to everybody. And he had pre-portioned out everything. So like, this is how much risotto or rice we have. This is how much, I mean, he put rum in like a vacuum seal package. The Everything was already pre-packaged. So he's like, okay, just throw this in, throw this in, throw this in. Rather than like, you have all this stuff and you need to take a teaspoon out. Take yeah. this to this. It just made it a lot easier. So we were able to like, kind of plug and play each ingredient. Uh, and it was one less thing you had to worry about. But yeah, it was a blast. That's awesome. I mean, we, everyone's meal seemed to come out great, which is, I mean, if that happens, you're doing something on the teaching <laughs> end. Some people are great, and some people are not great chefs. Um, and then you have to deal with different people's settings in their kitchens. And, of course, if some people are using gas and some people are using electric just to cook time, but everyone seemed to turn out good. And uh, I think we'll probably keep doing those until things normalize a little bit more. We also have a couple other virtual events coming up and we're just like having people pick up food from like peach tortilla next week. Um, and then we're doing a, a virtual chocolate uh, class uh, on the 26th. With, what does that uh, mean? Virtual, what does that mean? Virtual chocolate class, like so, learn, learn about chocolate. Yeah. So crystal, she's an amazing chocolatier over at Intero. And so she's going to be making a bunch of different chocolates and kind of walking us through the history of chocolate and then take you're tasting it. And then she's talking about it. And I mean, it's like a cheese tasting or a wine tasting, but yeah. this is what chocolate. Oof. Oh my God. So same sort of deal. You'll get the chocolate delivered and then you'll have uh, it out you it delivered, or you can go pick it up. Got it. Got it. And is this, this is only for members, right? <clears throat> yeah, this is the, this is only for members. Obviously with peach tortilla, you can go pick up their stuff at any time. And, and Tiro is offering it, uh, as is offering their chocolate class, uh, as well, not just to tasters table club members, but, our members are getting a discounted rate and yeah. uh, I mean, it's going to be a private event. So hopefully it's just going to, it'll probably, it'll probably be around 15 people in the meeting or in the class. And so it'll be pretty intimate. And just like yesterday, people were just asking questions. 
And that's a uh, great, that's a great thing, right? Like you're cooking at home. How many times have you been cooking at home? And, you know, even me, first of all, I'm not even that great a cook, but like, you know, even, even though I do have experience, even I have questions, right? Even I'm wondering sometimes doing shit like, fuck, what the, what the, what the hell do I even do here? Like you just go for it, right? You just like you go for it. But how great is it to have a chef right there and be like, Hey, look at this and look at the, like the video aspect of it too. Like they can see your dish and uh -huh. kind of, and kind of get an idea of, you know, yeah, this is great, man. So they can see how you're chopping too, you know, how you're cutting, how you're, uh, everything. Like you said, they can see your they, setup they too. They can, if you allow that. I, you know, me and my cook, cutting skills. I'm not, I'm not going to let them look at that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. You're like, you're like, chef, how, how am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's not a big deal don't worry yeah yeah, yeah. this will be There's great no no. i can call in the background medic medic yeah yeah medic, medic. b b where you at b you're like yeah, i love it uh no that's a great thing honestly i don't see why it wouldn't be something that would stay you know moving on why can't any restaurant or food place do this right like they could offer these sort of virtual classes for their meals right for the stuff they cook you know, sure, you want to yeah. you want to learn how to make our curried whatever, blah blah blah. You know, every Thursday at whatever we do a class, and you can join and pay X amount and blah. I think that's awesome. I, I just I don't know if it existed before. If it did, definitely not to this extent, right? I mean, I never heard of those really. I don't think I heard of those yeah, before. This. I think I think they did kind the virtual uh, cooking classes kind of existed, but I don't think anyone many people were really that interested in it. Um, but now you're, you're starting to see a good handful of restaurants trying to start offer that kind of service. Um, but the real, the real issue is for them is like, people don't want to see just some chef. They want to have some, they want to have whoever's in normally in charge of the kitchen. Like nobody wants to listen to me try and cook because I don't have any accolades to cooking. Um, or but like, so people want to see the head chef, the executive chef doing it. And, you know, as businesses start to try and normalize, uh, they're busy with their team. So it's like they would have to do it on their off days. Uh, is what yeah, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with that. Sunday night, you know, cooking classes, right? Those are the slowest night or Monday nights. Um, but also like the great thing about that is, and not to take away from a teaching chef, but a lot of times they may not have the experience that like a chef chef has, right? Like working in a restaurant. So like, that's the kind of, you know, that's what you want to hear. I mean, how great would it be to, you know, hear whoever, you know, great chef from the restaurant you like, you know, you get to check in on a class and cook with it. And when they normally don't do that. So you get access to, even though maybe virtual cooking existed, not with the chefs that would do it before. Right. And now you can get, maybe get access to, to them you know, which is yeah, great, that's, man. That's what, that's what we're starting to see. It's like they, uh, Phil Spears over at Commodore and a couple of the other guys created assembly kitchen and I, they're starting to run some programs off of that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think what makes this cool is a couple of places are offering like, you know, you could go pick up your ingredients and then they send you a video link and you follow the video link. Um, but the live ones, it's just, to me, it's, doing things live it's as close as you can get to being in person doing an event right now and i think people crave that kind of experience because you can actually talk back um which is huge because there's definitely times yesterday where we were making risotto i was like how do i know when to add more shrimp stock or how do i like is it supposed to taste like this what's it does it need to be saltier does it need to be thicker chewier crunchier like just different things where you you need to ask in the moment. You can't just like type it in on Google and then all of a sudden you're totally. five minutes in and your risotto went dry, which is like, you can't. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Instant feedback to what's happening uh, because you're right. Trying to type in comments or hope somebody's listening, you know, like that absolutely definitely makes it better. Um, so we've got basically virtual cooking classes and I do like the idea of restaurants offering, you know, par cooked, meals or pre-prepped meals i don't know how they're marketing it but you know you can come mm -hmm. home and and make it yourself plus it's you're gonna have a fresher dish 
as well. Sure. You know, you know, a lot of times some dishes just don't transport well. And, you know, it's been 40, 40 45 minutes. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And if you're worried about the transmission of the virus, in a sense, you can eliminate mm -hmm. all that. Right. You get everything out of the bags, cook it. You could, you know, heating it up to a certain point, you know what I mean? So you're, uh, plus you just, you can learn that way. I like the idea of a little pre prepped video, even though there's no instant feedback. Um, yeah. So I think it's working. I mean, it's, I think there's it's different. Working. Yeah. For a taster's table club in our brand, that's not the experience that we want to bring. Because well, that's also yours is from zero to, you know, from the beginning to the end where some of this cook it, you know, finish it at home. It's like, you're really just doing the last final steps to heat it up and get it together sort of thing. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I mean, they're different. I mean, you're going to be cooking in your class and doing a few courses and which is awesome eating it too with each other. So you get to share a meal and, you know, cook at the same time. So virtual, you know, cooking, what are other ways do you think, um, you know, restaurants right now, First of all, people have pivoted to to go and delivery, right? And curbside, this new term is going to be hot for a long time, right? Curbside service of, sure. you know, doing that type of food. But what, what are other ways that you've seen restaurants? Uh, you I know? mean, when you talk about curbside, I think it's important to really understand the, that a lot of these restaurants that are doing curbside obviously weren't doing it before. And what I've seen the most success uh, just from an outsider view is any restaurant that's that are doing these family meals like we're doing this family meal with peach tortilla and when i say that mm. that's gonna feed two to three people or like they're offering you know something that feeds four to six people and it's just a it's something for the restaurants that's like this is super feasible for us and we know we can sell it at a lower price point because honestly i don't want to get i don't want to be paying for fine dining and fi at fine dining prices because i'm not getting a fine dining experience yeah, I'm going and picking it up. Um, so I've seen a lot of that. Uh, and I, I think that's been a successful program for a lot of different restaurants. Um, and some restaurants are offering uh, groceries, grocery items with their deliver with their curbside. Or yeah, like, that's a good yeah. idea. You have Salt and Time and Cruz Teca and Foreign and Domestic. They have like actual grocery stores in their restaurants now. And you're starting to see with like Austin Food Shed investors, they're putting they're putting up like farm almost farmers markets in some restaurants around town. Um, so the, hopefully we'll start seeing more of that. And hopefully what we get out of all this, and when we get to 2020, is you're going to start seeing. I mean, I'm hopeful of this. We'll see what what it looks like. You'll start seeing a lot more people supporting the local farmers and and I mean growers because that's that's the sustainable food system that we can count on rather than these like mega meat packing corporations or whatever dole that's like having to ship stuff from all around the world but i mean if we get stuck in this position there's just not enough that it gets stalled whereas on the local level you should always be able to get local food yeah absolutely and it keeps them in business right they're doing great i, I talked to a, a rancher and farmer um, who's going to come on the podcast next week. Um, and he said his sales were up a thousand percent, you know, exactly. he's like, look, we're, we're crushing it right now. Like people are, are coming to us to get the food. So in a lot of ways, like what's great about it is it's before I, I think people had a hard time finding that connection. How do I connect with the farm? Right? Like, how do I, do I just go to central market and buy organic grass fed? They assume that's helping the farmer. It's not. Right. Yeah. Then, they, you know, they go buy at H-E-B or whatever. It's like they don't really know. Maybe they go to Wheatsville or Sprouts or, you know, they go to so they're still a little confused on how to do it. And now people are finding the connections. They're going to keep them right. Th those at once those avenues have been set and the bridge has been built like you're right. It's I think it will stick around. I think maybe they won't stay at a thousand percent. It may drop a little bit, but they'll be up yeah. from what their normal is. Right. Um, you know, yeah. yeah. I, I'm I'm excited to listen to that podcast when you do talk to him because I think when when things go back to normal, like people are going to realize that this produce and these eggs and these proteins that people that you're getting direct from the farmer, they do taste better. Like the eggs uh, yeah. that you get directly from a farmer, it's night and day than what you're getting in the grocery store. Like 
yeah, you're paying in HEB, you get 36 eggs and you pay $2.20 or whatever it is. And then you're like, oh, why am I paying $3 per dozen at these places? Which is like, that's a, that's cheap for farm fresh eggs. Yeah. Um, but like, it's got to be to the point where the convenience factor needs to be still be there because people are always going to go to the most convenient thing. I mean, Amazon has proven it time and time again. People yeah. buy anything for convenience. People don't even check Amazon to make sure that it's the that it's the least expensive anymore. They just know it's the most convenient. They're going to get their stuff in two days. Um, yeah, absolutely. So like, convenience factor has to be huge and. People just need to, the farmers need to, hopefully they can work together to figure out what's going to be best for convenience. Because I know there's a, another service called Vendor that's trying to make it easier and put farmers on their platform so that you can order from different farms around town. Um, but I think that's a, that's a much bigger hill to climb because uh, I don't think, I think everyone wants to help the local economy and the local farmers and stuff, but they're willing to do it to a point. Like if you can go to a farmer's market and get some of this stuff, that's great. But if you can have it delivered to your home or like around your schedule, people want that more. I think delivered to your home is like the best way. The farm box, that needs to be the new key yeah. phrase moving forward, farm box and getting that, you know, and even doing like what farm to table does where that you get these curated farm boxes. So it's a mix from different farms. Um, you might see more companies like that pop up. That, yeah, I wouldn't that, it's a you know. surprise because farmhouse delivery and you know farm to table they've done a good job. Uh, farm to table that was already their business model, uh, so I think they've seen a pretty huge growth in this. Um, but well, but they table, weren't doing direct to consumer before. No, no, farm farm to table wasn't. Farmhouse delivery was. Oh, farmhouse delivery. Okay, yeah, I don't even know that one. I don't. I yeah, don't know it's another delivery. one and. Uh, they, yeah, they've been doing that for a while now, and obviously they're spiking, but Farm to Table wasn't doing direct consumer yeah. before. So, far, uh, so, so Farmhouse is the same? They they curate from different farms, that sort of thing? Okay, okay, yeah, that, that's cool, right? Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, you're right. And again, you're getting better product, better quality. You know, the limes are juicier, the oranges are juicy is all anything right the meat is like amazing the vegetables are fresh and um you know the eggs especially the yolk crack that's a good idea get both eggs and crack them open at the same time so you see the real difference you'll notice right away the yolk is considerably different right like big time difference and when you eat it it just absolutely has a different flavor and actually you get more from the egg if you look closely, the egg, you actually get more from the egg because you got stunted growth from the other chicken eggs. They're made to, you know, uh, start uh, laying eggs too early, right? They pump them so much full of shit that they're like, you know, come out all weird looking, like they can barely support their bodies and they're laying eggs. And that's why those eggs are just, they're just, that's not the eggs you want, you know, get, yes. Absolutely. You know, it, it just the quality is so much better. But yeah, I'm excited about the farms and getting better food. And I think like you said, man, people don't, they're willing to help but to an extent. And I think actually, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's a reality that nobody wants to discuss. People love to just say, yeah, support the farms and hashtag farmers and, and blah, blah. It all sounds great, right? But like, are people really going to go that far? No, they're not. And that's okay. That's, that's, that's okay. You know, it, it's, that's it's the reality. Better. That's the reality. You got to admit it. And actually it's better that it, it, it comes from the farmers finding a better way to get it to the consumer than the consumer driving 75 miles out to the country to pull up in, to get a dozen eggs and a, a gallon of milk to take home. Right? Like it actually is better for that to happen because that's a better long-term solution for the farmers to have that, you know, ability, but absolutely delivery to your home is the key way for farmers to, you know, to, to make that happen and having, you know, that connection, like that's a hundred percent. I like the idea of curated companies bringing farmers together as long as that works good for the farmers, right? Like, and I think, uh, I think the farmer's markets are, you're going to start seeing a pivot or yeah. um, an additional service from the farmer's markets. And you're already starting to see some of it. Uh, but the farmer's markets are actually going to start putting together curated packages 
Yes. Like can get, maybe you don't feel comfortable going to the farmer's market, but Hey, there's 20 to 30 different vendors out here that we'd love to put their stuff into your home. So like order through X or X or X and we'll put it all together for you and deliver it to your home. Yeah. So, so basically, wait, wait. So are you saying like you would go to the farmer's market, you know, shop and then, and then leave the farmer's market and that stuff will be delivered to your home? So I'm saying that you won't even go to the farmer's market. I'm saying that it would be like a virtual ordering program. Oh, I like that too. A little virtual farmer's market. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So like, this farm has this much in it, but it has to, it's going to have to be a top down thing where it's like the farmer's markets have to have the tools to do it. And then the farmers, they have to tell them how much inventory they have or what they have that week. Because obviously when you're in a farmer's market, you bring what you have. You don't have to really inventory that much. And then you go back home with whatever you still have. But like yeah. if people are pre-ordering and whatever, you don't want to, you don't want to send, you don't want to send Harvey's eggs an order for like 600 eggs, 600 worth of eggs. And he only has 250 eggs. Like yeah. There has to be some inventory tracking. I see what you're saying. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Um, yeah. hundred percent. Um, as well as like, you know, another another point would be like butchers, you know, more butcher uh, shops to open up because right now there's just a couple in Austin. Right. Just literally, I think just a couple. And that's crazy. We're in Texas. If you talk to yeah. people outside of the, you know, America, they think we're butchering shit, shit left and right over here. Right. And that's not the reality. Um you know, I mean, I think one of your original podcasts uh, or videos was going talking with Salt and Time about that and how yeah. that's kind of faded out. Well, we could be in for a resurgence of it for sure, especially with like all these things with the meatpacking companies and everything that's coming out and whatever. Like, the thing is that those are companies are always going to exist because people need cheaper access to food um, because these. Right now, the butcher shops that are around are not necessarily serving. I mean, they're serving high quality meats, but it's not necessarily affordable uh, for uh, most yeah. of the public. Absolutely. Uh, which is, I mean, everyone's got to make their margins. Uh, I'm not faulting them on that. The, both the butcher shops that I've got that I go to, um, I'm pay, I know I'm paying a premium, but like I'm have, I have the means and I can support and I want to support the local business. Um, sure. But there are there are some smaller butcher shops in town that don't get much recognition, but they are around. And I think, I think you'll start seeing more and more from, from them. Absolutely. Plus the farmers need them too. You know, the podcast that I did with Jordan green really exp explained that process of, you know, packaging butchers and the farmers, right. And how everything can sort of work together on a local level. Um, and provide that for people. Um, and it's completely possible and it just creates new jobs, new markets, new, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. and then once that infrastructure is set up, it's really hard to take that away, right? Once things are set in place, which is why it's been so hard to get people to the local level, right? Because there's this big infrastructure on a national level, international level, global level, that's hard to break, right? It's just hard to break habits. Um, and yeah. again, convenience and price is a big deal. You're right. The price needs to start, but the more that it gets used, the price farmers can start to, you know, work with their price a little bit more, you know, that that's, I mean, that's, that's the reality of it too. If they know things are coming and they can plan on sales and blah, 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 they can start to work with that. Um, plus you just know that they care about their animals. They're treating their animals, you know, better everything is just so much more sustainable um and better for the environment i mean there's just so many pluses to it um it's not you know it's it's a great thing um so yeah so okay so we've got like virtual cooking you know farms you know making that connection uh with people directly um you know curbside these sort of things what else what else are are some other things that you think um, some businesses can or should be like the grocery store thing is a good idea to have sort of bodega style, which is very European and, and even Latin, you know, where you go into a place and it's, you do some grocery shopping. They got a, they even have a butcher shop. They got a sandwich shop, right? You're getting, it's like a little bit of everything. You can even get your fucking haircut done. Like a lot of times. Um, so 
uh, buy some jewelry even like it's like you know i'm not saying that we go that far but i definitely like the idea of a restaurant having a little grocery thing you know set up that's a great right they get product in they could totally curate little packages for people to take mm -hmm. home it's that's a really good idea yeah so i'd say the other some of the other things that uh that i'm hearing restaurants doing um is there there's a group called uh, good work austin and it's a collect they put together a pretty good amount of restaurants at this point and their their whole goal was you know livable wages and you know paid sick leave for restaurant workers and this was this was all part of their original uh plan but now they're putting together different initiatives to for restaurants to be a part of programs to feed people that's funded by the city and the state so like restaurants are making meal packages that and they're getting guaranteed uh guaranteed amounts of food that they're you know making every week that they're sending off obviously their margin isn't as high but you know that's something money to be made yeah it's um, something. okay that's cool all right so that's good there's programs like that being offered out there and then i mean every restaurant's just gonna have to get creative because you know you as a restaurant owner should know that there's gonna be once once they they say things are open and like at a hundred percent which i mean who knows but I, everyone that i talk to seems to think that that's going to be june 1st um yeah. there there's going to be that big wave of people coming in because people are just sick of being at home you're already starting to see people like the 25 percent capacity people are starting to go into restaurants and like there's there's a population just that just doesn't really i don't want to say care but doesn't feel susceptible to the disease and maybe they're not seeing elder people or people they think are susceptible and they're not worried about getting sick. So they're going to the restaurants and doing all the things that they normally would. Uh, so I think you'll start to see that more. And so I'm not, I'm not necessarily counting out like in dining service. Um, but saying that there are, there's the other half of the population that's probably won't be comfortable with dining for another year in a restaurant which is crazy to say because like, wow, that's such a big part of our life sure. or I'm in many people's lives is going out to restaurants. So like, I would say that a lot of these restaurants are still going to be having these, they're still going to be offering curbside where they weren't offering it before. And they're just going to keep to these packages. And what's, uh, what's also been successful is like reaching out to communities and be like, Hey, like we're doing a drop, for this community here on this day of the week, like get your oh, orders yeah. in. Like we're gonna do the drop on Thursday and get your communities to order by, you know, Wednesday at noon. And then everyone can come pick it up from the set location. And so that, that's like, a great idea. Yeah, that way you don't have one delivery driver just going back and forth and back yeah. and forth. Yeah. Because I mean, the, another huge thing is, is delivery apps and I mean, restaurants aren't, aren't thrilled with the margins that delivery apps take from you. And so a lot of them are doing their own deliveries, but I mean, they don't have the logistics to, to really have a, re a good system. But if you do have that one pickup location, that's a beautiful, I mean, that's great logistics because you send one person out with 20 different orders, everyone comes, picks it up within a time frame, and then you're done. Yeah, that's you're right. That's a that that is a great idea. Um, absolutely, um, I, and I, I think that's something again that can stick around. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know. Another you're thing about that, you're going to start seeing that a lot. I mean, you're already seeing it with food trucks too. Food trucks are going to different apartment complexes, communities, whatever, where they were going to office complexes and stuff because where are people officing at? Yeah, at home. So you have to meet them at home, and these all these apartment complexes and whatever are wanting to give their, their tenants a reason to stay there, to live there, whatever. So that's an extra bonus and the food trucks need money. Uh, and a lot of these mobile food trucks, they, they're going all over the city to these different apartment complexes. And from what I'm hearing, they're just as busy as they ever were uh, because people want to eat still. And if they can eat where they're working, that's always a, a much easier sell. 
Oh, of course. Uh, yeah, the food trucks going, meeting them where they are. Um, an another thing I would say, too, about like dining in, because that's going to get right, like, we're going to get there and people are going to go out. But like you said, there's going to be a lot of people that don't want to go out for quite a while. Uh, something that restaurants, I think, can do is extend their patio out. So like using their parking lots, like people are finding different ways to basically use the outdoor area to you know extend that out and make that bigger and and find ways to maximize your seating you know that that's the definitely the key um as yeah well. it, that's a, and that's definitely something that people are doing because i feel more comfortable eating outside than i do inside at this point yes um just because of i mean i've read all this all this stuff so I, yeah. i'm pretty well versed in what is safe and what's not um, and it's the air, air circulation, right? Like air circulation. Yeah. It's really that simple, you know, indoor, you just, every place is different. And some of the places you love to go to are like old little houses and this and that their air circulation is not very good in those places, right? They're just little nooks and crannies in different rooms. The air circulation is horrible. So yeah, it, it just outside is, is much better. We're, we're getting into good weather. So it, it's, it's fine. You know, yeah, you, you, you keep your, your tongue down there. I mean, I hope that we this weather seems nice, but you know it's going to get hot. This is Texas. It's, <laughs> it's going to get hot. It's going to get hot. Look, they get fans. You know that'll yeah. help blow stuff away. I don't know if that will scare people. Like, oh, you're blowing the stuff my way. I, I don't know. Like I, that to me would seem better. Like, let's just keep the air flowing. Uh, yeah. So it's going to be interesting. You mentioned parking lots and. It'll be interesting to see how this, at least in Austin, how they enforce that because you're required to have a certain amount of parking spots per seat yeah. or whatever at the restaurant. So it's not like you can go and say, mm, we're just going to take away half of our parking lot sure. spaces. Sure. I mean, you still need people. People still need a place to park if they're going to come eat at your place, right? I think it's, you know, just where you are just really maximize maybe on the grass whatever that you don't really didn't see people put tables out there right on the little sidewalk out front put tables out there like any little nook and cranny that you can start getting your your tables outside do that you know build out a little bit if you have to do that that's going to be your best bet um trying to expand your inside dining room makes zero sense in my opinion um you know it, it just doesn't make any sense plus there is no seating capacity outside so right. you, you can increase your revenue just by far because even though we're the goal is 25 percent, then 50 percent then i don't know if they're going 75 or if they're just going straight to 100 uh, but that could fluctuate they could limit it to 50 percent for a while or go back to it or whatever but outside will always stay you know probably 100 percent. so you know you, you can feel safe knowing that you know getting that going um Gosh, we, we've covered a lot of things, which is great. I, I want to sort of recap real quick. Okay, so like virtual cooking, uh, you know, offering that at classes or something, uh, your restaurant could do that. Um, we talked about family meals, offering family meals, which I think is a great idea. Most places definitely didn't offer that, but makes it easier for the kitchen. They can streamline those orders as opposed to having a thousand different orders, right? Like this is all for one, to, you know, it just makes it so much easier. Plus you can have stuff prepackaged, sort of ready to go. Um, so yes, family meals. Then we talked about curbside, right? Mm -hmm. and, and doing that correctly, um, you know, expanding the parking lots. Um, Talked a little bit about the farm and how the movement towards local farms is probably gonna yeah be. yeah the local farms that connection you know is is fantastic um yeah the the restaurants offering sort of a grocery sort of things the farmers markets right like virtual farms uh you know shopping that sort of thing um what if there was like god i just interrupted myself but i can't help it what if there was like a virtual Amazon farmer's market? Like it was farmer's market, but for but like Amazon, you know what I mean? But it's all farmer's stuff, you know, all organic. Yeah, so that, that's what uh, this app vendor, V-I-N-D-E-R, is supposed to, that's what they're trying to take over. Is that uh, the guy, I hope I'm not, is that Sam it, Lilly? Sam, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, I've actually need to get him on the podcast i've talked to him about coming on before um so now would probably be a good time we could talk about that um okay so that's what they're trying to do okay interesting well 
Yeah, that could work. Um, okay, so what else? What what have we not covered? Um, trying to think what I've seen. Um, you know, it's th- that's pretty much the stuff. I mean, there's really. I, I think this is something else I would mention that a restaurant or food business. This isn't exactly changing. This isn't ad- exactly adding a revenue stream, but I think this will bolster all of your different revenue streams if you promote yourself in a very you know safe clean pro- or following protocol procedure really push that to the forefront of your marketing show your employees wearing masks show that's oh a God. big thing like show that and and really enforce it at your business because i'm telling you people are ride or die on that there are people that if they pull up and see somebody not wearing a mask they're gone and they're telling 10 people about it like it spreads yeah. like wildfire so you definitely, you know, promote that in your business that you're following those protocols. And again, show people wearing masks, show it every day. Literally, that should be a post that's, that's every day and, and the cleanliness and the protocol. There's, it makes people feel safer. Even if, if you're doing it, and most places are, you got you mm-hmm. to even tell people you're doing it, right? Yeah, so that's, a, that's, in, that's definitely a good point to bring up because that's a lot of what the Good Work Austin team has been They've been hosting these Zoom calls like once a week and trying to put together a list of things that is feasible for all restaurants to hold a higher standard than what the National Restaurant Association put forward. And yeah, I mean, the the things that are no-brainers is that every staff person should be wearing a mask. I don't care if it makes you uncomfortable as a diner that everyone's wearing masks around you. It shows that you care about your employees because uh, yeah. they're wearing masks. Uh, the other thing is like, make sure to have hand sanitation everywhere. Any door that you touch, there should be a hand sanitation station outside of that. Yeah. Uh, and then just like being cognizant of how close tables and whatever are, because like, sure, even if you're outside, I mean, there's still a possibility, but if you're like back to back with someone, probably not great. But if you're like six feet away is what they're saying, uh, then that's, that's what you should be shooting for. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then, yeah, I mean, you know, they'll, if for good work, Austin, they're asking everyone that's participating to put like, you know, I'm, I'm following these guidelines and these are, these are two steps above what the national restaurant association is telling us to do. And they list out like everything that they're actually doing. Like, Every 30 minutes, they're cleaning everything. Yeah. And they're doing Jesus. every employee is required to wash their hands like every 20 minutes or whatever, like in different shifts. And like these, these restaurants, the, the ones that are smarter, having like an A team, not necessarily an A team and B team, but a, a one team and a two team. And they can't overlap because if one person happens to have COVID, you have to bench that whole team. And you I have see. to those can be in there at the same time. Yeah. So it's like having a it might be like having a, you know, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday shift and then the other day shifts. Uh so that, that way if Oh, if that's a good idea. You, that someone gets it that you don't have to shut down your whole restaurant. Yeah, that's a good because that's you've a, already started seeing, you've already started seeing restaurants close because one person had it. Dude, and home like, slice, they, right? Yeah. There's Home Slice. There's, uh, what was it? The Thai Fresh. Thai Fresh, um, yeah. There's, there's do you think Do you places. think that's the kiss of death right now for a place? No. If I'm, I mean, I, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a small, if you're super small and like just getting started and then you have to take two weeks off, sure. But like for those two places, they're kind of institutions at this point. And it's not, there are institutions that haven't ha- seen a decrease in following. Like there's institutions that you've seen close like Magnolia Cafe and Shady Grove, which for years they've had decline in customers. Yeah. Uh, and, and you'll continue to see those places close, which again is unfortunate. It's not something that I'm rooting for. It's just the reality is if you thought you might be closing in the next year in 2019, well then good chance you're about to close or you're closing in 2020 because this was like just the last thing you could handle. Absolutely. Um, does so so a place um, so a place if a, if an employee gets test you know po- test positive for COVID at a restaurant, you don't have any problem going back to that restaurant. No. 
Yeah, me neither. I, I don't either. Uh, but you know, people are going to have that that concern, you know. But again, I think if you're constantly promoting yourself and what you're doing behind the scenes, I think more than anything now, restaurants need to be so transparent about their process uh, yeah. and and not Do protect that, that, right? And of what they're doing and really show that. And another part of the the organization, what they're trying to push is like the whole reason why paid sick leave goes into this is because they want, they don't want people not coming. They don't want people coming in because they need that money. Like stay the fuck at home. If you're sick, you're going to yeah. get paid. You're yeah. sick. The last thing we want is you here. Like take a yeah. day off and, and we'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, so like they're doing that. And then it, it seems like at all the restaurants are doing the, uh, they're doing temperature testing with yeah. the guns. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like that's going to be pretty common. A lot of the fancier restaurants are only doing um, reservations. They're doing reservation only so they can cap it um, and try and keep people separated apart. Um, obviously, that only works at larger uh, fine, fine dining establishments. Yeah. Um, but like, it seems like everyone's trying to do everything they can. But since we've never lived through anything like this, everyone's trying to everyone's coming up with their own rules and uh the point of the the good work austin is like to make sure that everyone has a set of rules that they can agree on absolutely uh, the, the rest the national restaurant association put to, put together some some good guidelines but i don't think it's safe there i don't think they go to a level that makes everyone feel safe yeah, absolutely. Again, if you can go above and beyond and tell people you're doing that, like these are the guidelines, we're above that, right? We're doing that. That that's going to make people so much more comfortable to go to your your you know your place and um you know eat there, right? Like, and again, I, I don't think all of these, I don't think a you know restaurant or or a food truck or whatever catering whatever they are, they they don't need to do all of these revenue streams, right? I think a lot of them just need to figure out the few that work for them and their situation and, but really focus on that. That, that would be my key to pick a few and really focus on it, really promote it and kind of, mm -hmm. you know, get your, be, because restaurants and kitchens, especially it's all about a flow. It's all about the, the way things work, right? You work left to right. And it's just the way there's a flow to how you set up, uh, you know, the way things get prepped, cooked, plated, out to customer and there's just a flow to it and if they can just get that flow just right for the few things they're doing i mean you can make it right you can get through um you know i think peach tortilla is a great example of what to do during this time they they've been such in my opinion such a model company of this pivot since day one since it started i saw them adapt to the situation start promoting in such a way very transparent you know, mm -hmm. open conversation with the customer and, you know, just providing things that, that people needed. And, um, yeah, man, I mean, it, it sucks yeah, that restaurants yeah. have to do that, but. There's definitely like, for me, what, what I see on my social media, it's, it's basically, I see a lot of peach tortilla and what they're doing and like they were them. And so delivery have just been doing, really good things so delivery and they've given out so many meals and like yeah they they're really doing have. all the right and i mean their business model is really built for this kind of stuff because they're chinese delivery like yeah after people after like the first week where people were over like uh you know oh it's spread from asian food which is like the most ridiculous thing ever like their business model everyone wants food delivered um so like when you have Perfect. a model like that, you're you're in a good place. So and I think they did everything they could to help the community while I think their business was thriving. Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, you know, we'll we'll kind of end on this and, and sort of you know positively because the the truth is I have seen the restaurant industry respond in a great way, a very supportive way. You know, even the restaurant. That's what's so great about this industry. Like, even when it's on its knees, it's still reaching out to help other people. It's still yeah. serving me. I mean, it's like crazy to me. It's like, it's like they can't be selfish. It's like, you know, we don't know how. It's like always wanting to serve no matter what, right? It's what mm -hmm. we're in the business for is to serve, is to, you know, provide an experience. And I, I think for me, that's been 
the greatest thing. Um, you know, it's just been the greatest thing to see, man, to be honest with you. It's made me so proud to be a part of this industry and see so many, so many businesses, so many people, even while they're struggling, just doing so many things for other people that are struggling as well. It's like, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, and that's, and that's why a lot of these people are deemed frontline workers right now. Like they are because they're, they've been cooking they've been doing all these things and they're for sure at risk. Just like, just like a doctor or anyone else is. I mean, I'm not, I don't know if it's the same importance level, but it's, they're putting their lives at risk and they're trying to provide a service that people want and need. Um, and it's, it's very admirable. Absolutely. Man. I mean, it's food. We all need food. I mean, it's sustenance, like, you know, the grocery store workers, the distribution guys, the farmers, the, we need to eat. So yes, it's, it's, um, it, it is essential. Yeah. And, and the food pantries can't handle all the inquiries they're getting. Absolutely, man. I mean, it's insane. Um, yeah, it's insane. It's just been definitely, you know, that sort of thing. But again, just seeing the outpouring of support and the outpouring of groups and nonprofits and startups, you know, pop up to just try to help and we're doing this and we're doing that. And um, it, it's been phenomenal, man. Um, you know, and also, it does. It gives me hope for the restaurant industry. Um, to be honest with you, it does. It gives me hope for it. I know a lot of people are struggling, and I know, you know, there's a, a there's like 1.6 million service industry jobs in Texas, and mm -hmm. over 65 percent are not working right now. Right. So, or excuse me, 65 percent are working. I'm not sure. Actually, damn it. Which one is it? Uh, I can't remember which I, I stat it is. That, I know when you look at the unemployment numbers and you see how many of them are hit are hospitality related. And that might not be a restaurant, but it could be a hotel. It could be. Yeah, anyone. exactly. Exactly. But that's a large majority of the unemployment rate right now because oh, yeah. you know, if people aren't going out to eat, they're not going traveling, they're not doing all these things. Like That's a, a crucial part of the economy and where people get employed. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah. Uh, while there's been a good amount of resilience from restaurants, there's still uh, there's still a long ways to go. It is it is um it is sixty five percent are not working of those one point yeah. six million. That's that is the stat. I just I just brought it up mentally in my mind. That's the stat. Sixty five percent are not working. Dude, that's crazy. Um, yeah, it's the unemployment is insane. I talked about on the last podcast. They did they did a year's worth of unemployment applications in three weeks mm -hmm. so how crazy is that i mean imagine doing a year's worth of work of whatever job you have in three weeks pick your job scrunch a year's worth of work in three weeks and that's what they're dealing with it's 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 literally beyond insanity i mean it's not two times or three times i mean it's just be it's a number uh, so exponential um, and I mean, it's only growing yeah the texas the texas workforce commission is getting was getting three million calls a day what the i mean that's insane and they're like yeah we hadn't had that many calls in the first quarter of last year exactly yeah the whole first quarter exactly dude it's just so overwhelming and they literally had like a, i think a couple hundred employees to try to handle all these calls and of course and they've hired i think uh, over a thousand employees is still and it just still can't Right, all thousand the, employees for three million calls. It's Hello? it's like it's crazy, dude. Like, and still, anybody you talk to, at least like all the groups I'm a part of, everyone is just saying, "I can't get through. I can't get through. I can't get through." You know, it's crazy. I, with that kind of with that kind of flow, how do you get through? I don't even know. I mean, I've seen people just said they've been on hold for you know eight hours, ten hours. I've I've called. I've seen literally people comment like, I've been trying to call since March 13th. You know, like, damn, it's fucking middle of May. Like, they oh need, they need one of those systems where it's like, oh, well, you're, you're number 1,250,000 in line. Would you like to leave your number and we'll give you a call back? <laughs> yeah, we'll call you in early 2021, 20, February, 2 p.m. Yeah. And you're like, damn. Um, it, you know, but... It, to be fair to the Texas workforce, because I'm I am fair to like that's just a lot to handle for them. Um, yeah, it's an impossible task. It's, it's, it's an impo it's literally impossible task. But look, other states that I've heard about 
are doing even worse. So if people are bitching about Texas, right, you have it lucky. I'm telling you, it, this is mm-hmm. not easy for any, uh, you know, again, can you imagine the, that's just an exorbitant amount of activity, right? It's just, it's impossible. So yeah, man, look, it's, I've seen a lot of mostly positive things through all of this, you know, um, we just stay together, stay clean, you know, restaurant, we just support restaurants. Um, listen to the last podcast I put out top 10 ways to support restaurants right now. Um, and you know, if restaurants do these other things we're talking about, um, that that's a way for them to live. Cause I know some people are just hands in the air. I don't even know what to do. You know, they're worried about employees, payroll, taxes, you know, they, they don't even have time to be creative and market themselves and come up with these things. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, tough time, but, um, I'm glad we talked about this. I think a lot of good ways. Um, and anything else, Max, what do you think, man? Anything else you want to, I mean, no, I think, uh, I think we covered most of the things. If, uh, the listeners want to, want to join Taster's Table Club, I'd love, love to see him and go support Peach Tortilla and next week. And then in two weeks, uh, join our chocolate tasting with Intero. It's going to be a lot of fun. But uh, other than that, thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure talking with you, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. Awesome, dude. Yeah, man. Um, Okay, well, that's it, guys. Enjoy. We'll see you next time. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to email the podcast at patrick at texasrealfood.com. And don't forget, you can check us out on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, you know, all the different places you can get podcasts, you'll you'll find us on there. Or you can just go to our website, go to the LoneStarPlate.com, and uh, you can find everything you need there, all the episodes. Um, and you can check us out on YouTube if you want to watch it. You know, we video these, now, you know, on a little webcam here and do the Zoom stuff. And, um, you know, so if you feel like doing it that way, go to the Texas Real Food YouTube channel and you can find it there. Uh, Make sure to follow uh, Texas Real Food as well on Instagram and Facebook. Subscribe. Um, And if you, you know, are so inclined, please leave us a review anywhere you can. Um, You know, follow us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, That would really help us out uh, as well. So if you support, you know, what we're trying to do here. So thanks again for listening. Really do appreciate it. Um, Without you guys, you know, what's the point of doing this? Um, So if you have any suggestions on how we can make the show better, please let us know. All right. Thanks again. Be safe out there. Wash your hands.